Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, good morning, if you're in Washington or North America, um, good evening if you're tuning in uh, from Asia, uh, and welcome to the 2022 CSIS Asia Forecast. This is actually our 10th um, Asia Forecast with the team at CSIS covering the region, and we're delighted to have you join us. We're going to spend the next two hours looking at political, security, and economic developments across the Indo-Pacific, um, trying to anticipate uh, trends for the year, black swans, uh, electoral outcomes, market movement. Um, uh, we, uh, we cannot guarantee that past performance will give future earnings um, or that we will be 100% right in our predictions for the year. And to give ourselves a little bit of extra protection, we're going to include you, the audience, in this process so that we are sharing uh, responsibility for anticipating uh, events to come. Um, but it's an interactive process with our experts and your expertise in the audience, and we look forward to beginning to tease out what we can expect in this incredibly important region in the coming 12 months. We're going to have three panels. Uh, the first I'll moderate, and we will focus on uh, political developments uh, and diplomatic alignment and elections in the region. Um, the second panel will be chaired by Jude Blanchett. Uh, our Freeman Chair in uh, China Studies, and we'll look at security issues, hot spots, contingencies, uh, deterrence, proliferation. Um, the third panel will be chaired by Matt Goodman, our Senior Vice President for Economics and Simon Chair, and we'll look at market trends, trade agreements, technology decoupling, uh, and then Matt will wrap up the entire session for us at 11.05. We'll go over a few minutes um, if you uh, can stay with us. Um, the way this will work is, um, for each panel, we'll have a series of, of multiple choice questions um, asking uh, you, the audience, to predict what will happen in this region, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, in 2022. And you'll vote um, using the Zoom polling function. You'll see it appear in the middle of your screen. And um, uh, choose your um, uh, response. It's multiple choice. You can only choose one. Um, and then click Submit. And we'll give it a few seconds. And then as we get the aggregate answers, uh, from the audience. We'll put those up on the screen and then the moderator for each panel will ask the experts to respond, to agree, to disagree, to add nuance or counterfactuals as people see fit. Um, if we have time, we'll also get to some questions for each panel. You can submit the questions um, through the um, CSIS web uh, page for this event. And um, Hannah Fodell at the uh, Japan Chair will funnel those to the moderators so they can direct them to the panel. So let's get started with the first uh, panel um, on politics and leadership. Um, I'm joined uh, by uh, Victor Cha, who is the Senior Vice President and Korea Chair, and he's Professor and Vice Dean uh, and DS Song KF Professor of Government at Georgetown, where I also teach. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Mike Green, Senior Vice President for Asia, Japan Chair. Uh, and Kissinger Chair at CSIS and then Director of Asian Studies. So um, Victor and I have this beautifully symmetrical mutually assured destruction because we're each other's bosses at various points. Um, and then uh, in addition to Victor joining us, our, our, our newly inaugurated Australia Chair, uh, Dr. Charles Adele, um, Senior Advisor and Australia Chair, um, and uh, Yuko Nakano, a fellow with the Japan Chair to help us with the upcoming elections and politics in uh, in Japan, and Rick Rosso, Senior Advisor and Wadwani Chair in US-India uh, Policy Studies. So we're going to put up the first question about politics um, in 2022 in Asia, and the audience and the panel will have a chance to vote, and then we'll go through and see um, how our experts uh, reflect on the audience prediction. So Hannah, you can fire up the first question. Which election will have the biggest impact on Asian geopolitics in 2022. So you get a lot of elections in Asia this year, consequential. Which one will be most significant? And when you click your choice, then you hit submit.
I'll give it a few seconds. Hannah, tell me when you're ready. This is an anonymous poll, by the way. We, we have no idea who you are. Um, there was no voter ID required, so we're, we're, you're totally anonymous. Okay, uh, uh, Charlie, Yuko, everyone, you can see this result. So um, we'll keep the poll up for a minute as we reflect on it. Um, so 43% of the respondents said the US midterms uh, in November. And seeing as the US is the biggest power, that, that, that makes sense. Um, Korea, 24%, the South Korean presidential election. Japan's upper house election, 18%, that's quite high. I'm surprised a little bit at Australia's low result, but maybe that's because uh, the foreign policy won't change so much. And then the Philippines, where Mr. Duterte's tenure, we think, will come to an end. So why don't we uh, go down the panel? We'll save the midterms for last, and I'll come back to you on the midterms. But um, uh, let's start with Korea, Victor, because that was of the of the of the Indo-Pacific elections, the one that got the biggest vote. What what do you expect, and why does it matter? Um, so I, I think that's I would agree. I think that's probably right. Uh, we're five weeks out from the election in Korea, um, and uh, for the United States, this election actually um, uh, is quite consequential for U.S. policy and Biden's coalitional diplomacy in Asia. I actually have a piece in Foreign Policy Today that sort of outlines some of the differences in policy, whether whether it's with regard to the Quad or, um, or climate or uh, nuclear energy. Um, there, are, there are a whole host of things where we see differences between the two parties. Interesting, one of the areas where there hasn't been difference has been on uh, relations with Japan and improving trilateral coordination. So that's actually that's actually good news. Um, <clears throat> uh, but the differences are significant. And, and I don't think, I, I cannot remember, maybe my, I, you can remember, I can't remember a South Korean election recently where the foreign policy differences were so stark in a way that mattered for the United States as it coincides with a new, new administration here that's trying to undertake, you know, a big new effort in Asia, uh, working with all the allies. So I think I think that's pretty accurate to say it's the second most uh, consequential um, election in Asia this year. Just to drill in on that, um, the stark difference in foreign policy between the two camps um, is not as much the Korea alliance, right? It's more China and North Korea. Can you say something about that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there are some differences on the alliance, particularly on OPCON tran transfer, uh, transfer wartime operational control to Korea. There are some differences. Uh, there are some differences on joint military exercising, although the ruling party hasn't really laid out its plan. The opposition party, the conservatives have said pretty clearly they want to resume those. But on China uh, in particular, you know, you have a, a, a opposition party conservative candidate who's been maybe not clear on what he wants to do with China, but clear on what he stands for. And that is uh, liberal, open democratic order, you, South Korea support of that, um, opposition to, to changing rules by fiat in the international system and in the regional order. And that pretty much suggests their, their position on China. Also, the view that they're interested in participating more actively in the Quad, you know, under this uh, opposition party conservative candidate. Whereas for the ruling party, it seems like it's more of the same, which is to, to do this delicate balance between the United States and China. And the primary driving factor for that is the, the perceived view that North Korea, uh, North Korea policy hinges on policy with regard to China. Um, so I think there are, big, there, there, are, there are certainly big differences there. Um, on supply chains also, there seems to be um, more of a, interest in the opposition party candidate uh, for working with the United States on some of these supply chain efforts, uh, not as clearly laid out in the, um, in the ruling, party, uh, uh, op uh, ruling party progressive candidate. Now, having said that, the advisors that you and I know well for both of these candidates are very experienced, professional, former diplomats with, um, who are very much sort of in the middle of the road pro-alliance and in the middle of the road politically. And so that's a good, that's a good sign. So, you know, right now it looks like there are some differences that are important and we'll see once the new government is elected, whether they will actually do what they said during the campaign. You want to, you want to put it out there and handicap the outcome or is it too close to call? Or right now politics, so who knows? Yeah. 
I mean, it's like the last minute of the Kansas City Buffalo game. I mean, you know, it the, the lead changes every it, it changes every week. At one point, everybody thought uh, Lee Jae Myung, the governor, uh, Governor Lee Jae Myung, had this all sewn up, the ruling party candidate. And then in the past week, Yoon uh, Yoon Suk Yeol, the the opposition conservative candidate, now has pulled ahead. So um, it's uh, it's very much touch and go. So I think it'll go down to the wire. Yuko, I think Japan's election, if I remember correctly, was uh, second most consequential in the region. Um, it's an upper house election, right? So it's not going to determine necessarily who's prime minister or in the cabinet. But when the government loses control of the upper house, it's pretty, pretty significant. So uh, it, probably what July we're looking at for this election. What, what, what do you expect? Yes, uh, Dr. Green, thank you for your first question. So uh, half of the 245 seats in the House of Councillors or the upper house uh, will face a re-election this summer, or most likely in July. And if the ruling coalition can retain the majority, uh, it will further solidify Prime Minister Kishida's footing, as he will not have to face another national election for three years. Uh, enough time to set an ambitious agenda, possibly including a constitutional revision, uh, which would have great uh, implications on Asian uh, geopolitics. And currently, the LDP and its coalition partner, Komeito, have 139 seats combined, uh, 16 more than the simple majority. And six months is a long time in politics, and uh, many factors can affect the outcome, including you know, how uh, Mr. Kishida engages with China, for instance. But today, uh, I like to uh, highlight uh, two domestic factors here, uh, which uh, would impact the polling uh, for the upcoming election. And the first is uh, COVID cases and whether the uh, public opinion on the government's handling of the pandemic uh, will shift in the coming weeks as Japan is facing its uh, sixth wave of the infections. And the second uh, factor is whether corporations uh, will agree on a pay hike at their annual wage negotiations between management and labor unions, which uh, typically uh, takes place across Japan uh, from February to March. And it is an important feature in uh, Prime Minister's uh, uh, economic strategy. And uh, he has called for a pay hike of over 3% and even offered uh, tax reductions for companies uh, implement such hikes. And at the moment, uh, the public does not seem to be uh, optimistic on wage increase implementation. But if it happens, uh, it'll be a good surprise and may help uh, boost Mr. Kishida's uh, popularity ahead of the election. Thank you. So, Charlie, I think Australia was next. If we look back at 2021 and ask the question, which U.S. alliance in Asia had the most significant upgrade, I think Australia would be the clear winner with AUKUS, the Quad, um, uh, the increase in Australian defense uh, budgets and sovereign missile uh, pro <laughs> programs. Um, but but people didn't seem to think that the geopolitical implications of the of the election are quite significant. Is that because the bipartisan consensus is baked in, or what should we expect? I, I think that's right. I mean, Mike, uh, you kicked off by saying that uh, it looks like Australia was the winner or the loser, depending on how you look at this, by uh, you know smallest delta, smallest change. Uh, in fact, uh, the election which is coming up, uh, we don't yet know the exact date, but it's looking like it will probably be late spring, round about May. Uh, is going to be a really close run thing. I mean, it's it's down to the wire here in a couple of seats in Western Australia that will determine the outcome. But foreign policy uh, at this point, uh, you know, we're getting towards an election, so there'll be some differences articulated. But in broad strokes, first of all, the Australians pride themselves on taking a more or less bipartisan line when it comes to national security. And you can see this on display because the first event of the election season kicked off yesterday in Australia. The opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, gave a speech uh, at the National Press Club down in Canberra. And he said, don't expect any changes on China policy under a Labour government if Labour were to take it away from the coalition. Uh, and that's because, as he said, which I think almost all Australians would agree with, it's China that's changed, not Australia. And so if you look at the major changes in Australian policy, uh, whether it's the uh, you know, decided increase in their defense spending, right, 6% uh, more spending up to $270 billion Australian dollars for the next 10 years, if it's with the Quad, if it's the AUKUS, you actually see fairly tight alignment between the coalition that's now running uh, the Australian government and the opposition party. 
There are differences, of course, on the margin. There are critiques that are, you know, kind of being sharpened uh, by the opposition. And uh, although my read on the situation is the critiques send, tend to say uh, that the government is uh, not being subtle enough and not doing enough, particularly on the development and the aid baskets and with their Southeast Asian partners, no less in the Pacific. So at least the calls are going to be to do more, not less in Australia at this point. So did anybody on the panel uh, put the US midterms as the most significant election, show of hands? Interesting, um, and yet it won. And we have a lot of people, I suspect, tuning in from Asia who may have said that because um, you know we're a little unpredictable ourselves these days. Anybody want to weigh in on the midterms? I certainly have views on what they could mean. I mean, it seems to me that, first of all, the bipartisanship that, that Charlie described in Australia, usually to describe the US Congress, bipartisan would not be the first word you choose as a descriptor. But I think all of us who've interacted with members on both sides of the aisle would probably say that's true of our alliances, um, definitely of our alliances. Um, in fact, more robust bipartisanship around uh, US, Australia, US, Korea, US, Japan, and the US India relationship than ever in my experience in Washington. And a pretty broad, if, if sometimes contested consensus about competing with China. Um, it seems to me that if the Republicans do take the house, um, uh, the first instinct people may have, particularly in Asia, is well, that will be a complete deadlock, you know, divided government. But um, but the founders were clever, and divided government can sometimes produce more results. And I, I'm not sure if I predict this, but I do take some hope from 1994, when the early Clinton administration had a very ambitious domestic agenda, much like not quite as ambitious, but much like Joe Biden today, couldn't do it lost in the midterms um, with the Newt Gingrich revolution, uh, the, the predictions of, you know, gridlock and everything. But actually, the next three, four years, the Clinton administration uh, finished NAFTA, um, upgraded the US-Japan alliance in 1996, NATO expansion, and then China's accession to WTO. So the most consequential things that the Clinton administration did on trade and on defense happened with a Republican Congress. And it's a different Republican Party today. It's a different Congress. I, I think that might happen. But any other any other reflections on our midterms? Since it, none of you voted for that one, but it did win in the audience poll. Show of hands if you want to jump in. Yeah, Victor. So I mean, I, I think I, I mean I think what you said, Mike, is interesting, and that could very well be the case. I mean, if I were to think about this from folks um, outside the United States, or maybe even inside, who who voted for that, the other element might be. You know, concern about it would impact policy in the sense that there'd be concern about distraction domestically, uh, particularly if it's if it, if there there's content it's a contentious election and you know you know all sorts of things happen that that will be so focused and torn apart domestically that that would naturally affect what we'd want to do abroad. That's a good point. It, it isn't going to be pretty, that's for sure. And and it, and it just reinforces the old adage that when America uh, sneezes, Asia catches a cold. Um, uh, let's do the next question, if you could put that up, Hannah. Which leader, and this flows directly from our previous one, but which leader will have the best year politically in 2022? Narendra Modi, Fumio Kishida, Scott Morrison, whoever wins the presidential election in South Korea, or Kim Jong-un. Of course, Kim Jong-un always has a great year, but um, let's give people a chance to vote. And we don't just mean who wins elections, but who gets their agenda done and things like that. And Hannah, go ahead and put the poll result up when you're ready. Kishida, interesting. Um, uh, so Kishida is gonna have the best year. We don't wanna jinx him, right? But uh, he does have an upper house election, but 33% thought Prime Minister Kishida of Japan would have the best year followed by Narendra Modi. Um, and um, and then uh, whoever wins the South Korean election and Scott Morrison, so some, some votes for Morrison. So Rick, why don't you kick us off? Um, is Modi gonna have a good year? Yeah, I think the table set for some real successes politically. Um, you know, most notably, I think uh, uh, with India having such a deep trough, deeper than most large countries uh, during the midst of COVID in terms of uh, economic decline, um, they're poised by most international rating agencies to have one of the best years this year, growing over 9% as well as uh, into uh, 2023. 
And uh, the Modi government has been uh, uniquely capable, I think, among uh, recent Indian political parties in uh, taking that kind of data and, and turning it into wrapping themselves around it and getting uh, some political mileage out of it. So, so economic growth is most likely the, the one factor that we can count on that's going to He's going to be able to really kind of, uh, you know, buoy himself up with uh, with support. Uh, three others that could go kind of either way. Number one, obviously, every conversation is going to be uh, completely uh, uh, filtered and penetrated through the lens of COVID and uh, whether India suffers another one of these uh, massive uh, uh, infection rates. And, 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 you know, as we saw last uh, last spring in particular. But so far, you know, he's remained despite these these horrific humanitarian challenges India has faced, which is you know, probably more cases and more deaths than the rest of the world combined. Uh, you know, if you look at some of the third party reports that have been done on top of government data, um, he's remained pretty Teflon on this. You know, I mean, you don't see him being challenged and taken to task on COVID uh, as opposed to, you know, agriculture reforms and some other kind of topics there. Uh, another topic that um, could, could kind of flip either way here is the potential application of U.S. sanctions um, because of India's continued acquisition of Russian military equipment, in particular, uh, just recently taking possession of the first of these uh, S-400 missile defense kits. Now, if the United States uh, manages to find a solution, a pass-through to not sanction India, you know, uh, that certainly would be a win in country. Uh, if we do sanction India, which uh, I don't think that, um, you know, we can take it for granted that we're going to make it through this, you know, there's still a lot of work that has to be done. Um, that could that could really kind of blow up. I mean, either he takes a political hit for it, or as other leaders have done, decides to come out more confrontational with the United States and tries to uh, you know win back political support because of that. So sanctions is going to have a, a big uh, a big uh, I think uh, role to play here as well. Last thing I'll mention uh, that you know is kind of the unknown but we're going to know pretty soon state elections. You know sometimes we portray Modi as this uh, you know political juggernaut as uh, crippling democracy things like that. Actually his party has been steadily losing state elections. Today they're only in charge of 12 of India's 28 states and six of those are up for election this year. So uh, when you're only going to be defending territory during the year, um, you have a lot of opportunities to stumble. If he wins, including the monster state of Uttar Pradesh, which is just about to go to elections, uh, huge wind at his back. Uh, if he loses a bunch of these, um, you know that's going to be pretty politically divisive. And you may find some of these uh, new interests on trade integration, things like that. They might cut that off and go back to the base and support some of these uh, religious intolerance issues we've seen recently. So growth uh, is probably the one thing that I, I think most likely is going to buoy him. And then between COVID, sanctions, and state elections, um, those are the three to watch to see whether or not uh, he'll, he'll, he'll go up or down in, uh, in political view in India and around the world. And as you point out in your work on, on the Indian states, Rick, a lot of the decisions that matter on the economy are at the state level. And that's probably, I'm guessing, a, a, a breeding ground or a grooming uh, uh, arena for new leaders for the Congress party uh, to watch down the road, right? Well, we hope so, but you know, unfortunately, you know, we've seen um, some of the some of the young rising leaders in the Congress Party. Um, they they've actually been abandoning and going to BJP. Um, so it, it should be that breeding ground, um, but they haven't allowed a lot of space, frankly, for for others outside of you know the family and the closest confidants um, to really kind of build up independently their persona and such. So um, you know, so they do have you know in, in the state of Punjab, which is one of the few large states that Congress still controls leadership transitions and, and a lot of wobbliness there. So um, you, you'd think that would be the case. Uh, so far, you really haven't seen those kind of regional leaders rise. And the uh, the family still continues to put a lot of pressure on, on remaining, you know, at the top of the top of the ladder. It, 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 it's a little bit like Japan, uh, Yuko, because um, uh, you're not seeing leaders emerge in the opposition in Japan who might who might do the same kind of thing to challenge the uh, LDP coalition's dominance. People people seem to think on the whole, Kishida will have a good year. Um, is his agenda achievable? He's talked about things like a new model of capitalism, but I'm not sure anyone knows quite what that means. Do you think he'll be able to achieve some big things as prime minister? Well, um, certainly uh, it was a great result for uh, Mr. Kishida, and I hope uh, he's watching this event. <laughs> Uh, when uh, Mr. Kishida was elected prime minister, the support by the public was somewhat lukewarm. Uh, but in the following weeks, the cabinet approval rating gradually increased up to uh, 60 percent, uh, although the latest Kyoto poll shows a slight dip by uh, four points. And in uh, 2022, uh, Mr. Kishida faces four major hurdles. And uh, first and foremost is uh, how well he can manage the resurgence of COVID uh, cases. And the second is what we call details and executions. 
uh, hundred days into his administration, he has launched a set of panels and task forces on issues uh, ranging from economic security to defense policy and digital infrastructure and the imperial family succession. And so we are waiting to see if uh, any actionable and impactful uh, policies uh, will come out of those panels. And the third uh, hurdle is to uh, manage support within the LDP. Uh, in uh, addition to the coalition partner committee, uh, Mr. Kishida also needs to manage uh, different voices within the party. Uh, he leads the fourth uh, largest faction uh, in the party uh, and needs a support from different factions and groups outside of his own for a steady stewardship. And the fourth uh, hurdle is, of course, the upper house election. Uh, on the eve of the leadership election last September, uh, Mr. Kishida uh, said that he was competing a triathlon, uh, meaning he would uh, not uh, cross his finish line until he has won the party leadership election, the lower house election, and the upper house election. And he has uh, completed the first two stages, but now every major decision his government is going to make for the next six months will have uh, that upper house election hanging over it. Uh, so we'll have to wait until the election is over to see the true colors of uh, Prime Minister Kishida's leadership. If, if his ruling coalition prevails in the upper house election, he has clear sailing for a number of years, right? Then, yes. then more than any of the leaders we're talking about, really, he has uh, a mandate to, to move forward if he can get through this third part of the triathlon, triathlon hunt. Yes, that, that's correct. And he has at least like a three years uh, for a free uh, national election, but uh, in, in actually two years, uh, uh, the party leadership will, election will be coming up. And Charlie, um, Scott Morrison, um, uh, you know, it depends on the election, too close to call, depends on Western Australia. But in terms of the agenda Morrison's put in place, um, is it going to be a good year for his agenda, regardless of the outcome of the election? You mentioned bipartisanship, but he's he's um, he gets dinged on climate change uh, by the opposition and some critics around the world sometimes. Um, uh, seems to have support, as you said, for his approach on China and the alliance. Um, is is his legacy, you know, regardless of the outcome, going to be consequential? Do you think? Uh, well, look, I mean, the first part of the answer is uh, it all depends uh, on what happens in May. Uh, he wins if he wins. Uh, <clears throat> and by the way, the polls, it's its something of a national sport, right? Uh, weekly polls come out in Australia, kind of horse race tracking. Uh, and it's really close, but the coalition government is behind uh, right now. That's the party, again, that's in power. And they've been behind for nearly a year at this point. By the way, this is not unique, uh, because the last time Australia went to the polls for a federal election in 2019, the exact same dynamics were at play. Uh, the government, the coalition, had been behind for nearly a year, and then Scott Morrison uh, pulled a rabbit out of a hat, uh, right, and, and won. So I say that what happens will, in many ways, uh, determine his legacy. Just like in the U.S., uh, you are considered successful if you win a second term, if he can go against the grain of what a lot of people think right now, if he were to win election again, he will really be seen as kind of a quite, uh, you know, politically adroit and his series of policies will go forward. However, uh, and you did ask about climate, the coalition is facing pressure um, on climate, both from within and from without. Uh, both the Labour and the Liberal parties have put forward their uh, ideas about climate and where would they would move to. Labor's is much more ambitious. Uh, they actually have a fair amount of uh, business backing behind them. Uh, <clears throat> the coalition government has said that theirs is unrealistic, but they're also getting pressure, we know, uh, from the Biden administration and from others. <clears throat> Not to mention, uh, from a geopolitical perspective, the major handicap of Australian foreign policy is probably their climate policy, particularly as they deal with their neighbors in the Pacific. Uh, which is strategically of great importance to Australia. Uh, and the number one issue in the Pacific Island region is not China, uh, but climate change. So it does strike me that uh, this is an issue that uh, there's some movement on by both parties, uh, but this is the one that is coming under, I think, uh, pressure uh, the most from them. This, this comes out clearly in surveys we've done at 
um, CSIS and other institutes in Australia have done that climate change is the is an existential security threat. The China competition is, you know, further down the list for 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 parts of the Pacific. Uh, Yuko, could you? Uh, sorry, Hannah, could you quickly show the last poll again? I want to see how Kim Jong Un did before I go to Victor. Huh? Okay, he's not going to have the best year. What do you think, Victor? Of course, according to Norong Shimun, he always has the best year. But what? <laughs> what, uh, what? What do you think? Um, well, I mean, you know, we never know with North Korea, but it could be a, another difficult year. You know, they're still shut down because of COVID. They're now going into their third year of a border lockdown with China, which has dropped bilateral trade between North Korea and China by over 80 percent year on year, when 90 percent of their external trade is only with China. Um, you know, we've seen through satellite imagery that they're trying to convert some air bases along the Chinese border into storage uh, quarantine facilities where they can partially open up the border. But there's really no they, there's no um, light at the end of the tunnel for North Korea when it comes to COVID. They have no vaccines. They have no PPE. They have no public health system. Uh, and so uh, that means they're going to stay shut down for a very long time. And the North Korean leader in the New Year's address did not talk about nuclear weapons. He only talked about um, uh, food and the economy. So that's going to be, that's going to, you know, it could be a very difficult year for them. Um, on South Korea, you know, I think it, I think that's right. I think whoever wins the election, the first year generally tends to be a good year. You know, it's a single five-year term. So they turn into lame ducks later on in their term, but in the beginning they have this mandate. And so I think it could potentially be a good year. I mean, they're, their COVID rates by the time the new uh, president is elected should be on, uh, if, if, you know, as long as we don't have another wave, because that uh, should be uh, on the decline because they're sort of just starting to ramp up in, in terms of the Omicron wave now. Um, on the alliance, the Biden administration basically has been patiently and politely waiting for the new government to come in so that they can really start to move forward on you know, all of the things that they talked about in the Biden Moon Summit uh, in May of last year. As we said earlier, relations with Japan will probably improve and that'll be uh, very important. I mean, they still have domestic problems clearly that will have to be addressed, most prominent of which are uh, the incredibly high housing prices. Housing prices doubled during the, during the Moon Jae-in presidency. And then also this uh, perennial problem of underemployment or, you know, overeducated uh, young Koreans, who can't get full time uh, full time jobs, and so these you know these are the the main domestic problems they're going to have to deal with. But overall, it could be a good uh, first year for the new South Korean president. Sounds like for Japan, for Korea, and for Australia, and, and I suppose by extension for India, the the bipartisan consensus on 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 China is is more baked than it has ever been, and the the variables that will determine. Politics are going to be things like housing prices, COVID, economic growth, things like that. Um, Victor, last quick question. If Kim Jong-un has a bad year, does that mean the rest of us have a good year or a bad year? Does this, does it, you know, does a, does a, does a tougher situation within North Korea make, make provocations, ICBM or nuclear tests more likely, or does it make negotiations um, uh, and diplomacy more likely? It's a hot debate, but in 30 seconds or less, which, and, and you're not allowed to say it could be either one. Yeah, no, I, I think for certain we can count on North Korean provocations ramping up in the first year of a new South Korean government. I, I think that's almost certainly going to be the case. And, you know, as we did when we were in government, no one likes these provocations, but you try to make lemonade out of the lemon. Um, and, uh, you know, this will provide uh, greater impetus for uh, um, coalitions with regard to sanctions, improvements in US ROK, Japan defense and intelligence sharing and missile defense. You know, no one likes these provocations, but they're going to come and you might as well, you know, make the best out of them that you can. Um, next question, then. Thanks. Which bilateral relationship, good segue, uh, will improve in 2022, Japan and South Korea, Australia and China, North and South Korea, India and China, or none of the above? Quick submit, we'll get the poll answers up in a minute. And if you have questions for the panel, we might have time, I'm, I'm not sure, but go ahead and put those into the um, CSIS website uh, question uh, portal. And uh, well, I, I, Victor set that one up pretty well. Um, over half of you said Japan and South Korea 
relations will improve. Nobody, nobody thinks Australia-China relations will improve. We'll come to Charlie on that in a minute, or North and South Korea, or India and China. 31% said none of the above. We are in an era of kind of nationalism and uh, legitimacy crises for governments. And so it's not always a bad guess to say relations will tend to get worse among countries. But, but on the whole, the audience was optimistic, beginning with Japan, South Korea. Yuko, why don't I turn to you first on that one? What is the political environment in Japan going to be like in the coming year um, for um, relations with South Korea? You know, Victor pointed to the external and, and North Korea and geopolitical um, uh, pressures, but Japan has its own domestic political calendar. One, two, three, four. As well. Thanks. Well, uh, actually, the audience surprised me on this one. <laughs> You know, according to an annual survey on foreign policy uh, conducted by the cabinet office, only 19% thinks that Japan and South Korea have good relations now. And Japan is aware that it is in its own interest to improve ties with its neighbor, and especially with the security in Northeast Asia in mind. And also it's keenly aware that it is what the United States would like to see. Uh, but that said, I'll be hard pressed to predict that Japan would be, uh, or Japanese government would be ready to make much concession on the wartime labor compensation disputes or the 2015 agreement on the issue of comfort women. So uh, the change in the leadership in Seoul uh, might help uh, reset uh, South Korea Japan relations, but I, I will not be holding my breath. I have to say, Victor, when we've talked to our friends who are advising the two campaigns in Seoul, there is a, a real appetite for trying to improve relations with Japan, as you said, regardless of who wins. And that's very encouraging. But as you know, when we have those same conversations with political uh, leaders and political friends in Japan, nobody's jumping up and down with excitement at this development. And I think part of the reason is because I sense part of the premise for the South Korean side is that with goodwill, they can return to these core issues of disagreement, um, the, 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 the Comfort Women Agreement of 2015 and then uh, compensation, which the Japanese side considers waived under the 1965 Normalization Agreement. So there's an appetite on the Korean side, but I'm wondering if the camps are a little unrealistic. Um, and also if the US can play a role, always tricky, you and I have been in this mix before. Um, what, let, let's go back to your earlier answer and now temper it with Yuko's observations on polling in Japan. No, I, you know, I do think that, uh, I mean, I, I entirely agree with what you go and what you have said. I mean, I think, you know, I think the harder lift in terms of improving the relationship is going to be on the Japan side, just because there's been, you know, a real sea change in views on Korea because of events over the past few years. Um, the, I think the United States does play a role. We've already seen I think some of the um, results of that in in the Moon government, even the Moon government, as they are about to leave office, you know, Moon has you know effectively reaffirmed the 2015 Comfort Woman Agreement. Governor Lee has come a long way from where he was at the beginning of the campaign on relations with Japan to the point where they are basically mimicking the same uh, proactive, uh, positive outlook uh, and effort on the relationship that the that the opposition camp um, is doing. And then on these cases, you know, the Seoul court has dismi dismissed some of these cases with regard to wartime labor compensation. And of course, Prime Minister Kishida was foreign minister when the 2015 agreement uh, was reached. So, um, so I think that the platform, at least on the South Korean side, is there for either uh, candidate who wins to, to move forward. Um, the United States will certainly be very focused on doing this with the with the new administration in South Korea. Um, and then I think the, the hard work for both uh, um, uh, uh, Japanese leaders, for Korean leaders and for U.S. leaders will be uh, the, 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 the view in Japan. I think that's that's a very re realistic way of looking at this. I, I think it'll be um, hard to do more than some initial gestures before Japan's upper house election because of Kishida's own background negotiating deals that then got reopened in Seoul. And the U.S. role probably is going to be best applied in focusing on the geopolitical challenges we face. And as you would have all said, those are going to get tougher this year for Seoul and Tokyo. Um, real quick uh, on the China relationship. Can I just say, can, can yeah, I just say, I, I, agree, I agree with that. I mean, Part of the issue is, I think, on is, is the extent to which 
you know, I certainly understand the point about 2015 comfort women and grieving in Kishi. The part of it is the extent to which I think the narrative on that particular issue and the South Korean walk back on that um, is, is one, it wasn't really something, as you know, that was directed at Japan. Right. It was entirely about domestic politics in right. South Korea. Right, entirely. It almost had nothing to do with Japan yeah. in that. So, but you know, that's hard. That's a hard narrative to to create. Yeah. No. I mean, clearly, the South Korean progressives want to reopen issues negotiated by South Korean conservatives at a time when Japanese politicians across almost all parties want to try to close this chapter. So it's the 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 the, the tempo, the direction, the domestic politics make this harder. Um. Yeah. Rick, and then Charlie. You know. Uh, China, 2020, 2021, China was not exactly warm and cuddly with either Delhi or Canberra. Could that be turned around, do you think, 2022? Start with Rick? I, I don't see it happening. I mean, it could improve moderately. I mean, you've got uh, real border tensions and, of course, troops being killed. But so coming a little bit, you know, half a step better from that uh, is maybe feasible. But the, uh, the the more entrenched issues, you know, about cyber attacks against Indian power grids, the trade imbalance, uh, China's inroads and approaches across South Asia and India's neighborhood, um, unless China voluntarily gives up those steps, um, I think the roots of tension aren't going to go away. So I, I don't see a lot of scope for improvement. Yeah, I, I would say uh, similarly, um, it, look, it takes two to tango on these dynamics. Uh, and if we had say that Australia and Chinese relationships are in a trough or in a, a cold freeze at this point, <clears throat> On the one hand, there's nowhere to go but up. Uh, and, you know, especially if there is a change in who the government is in Australia, there might be some attempts to kind of reset rhetorically, at least uh, where they are. But you have to kind of pull back from this to understand what Australia has gone through with China over the past year. The fact that in the past year alone, the economic hammer has come down repeatedly and in increasing uh, measures on Australia, probably more than any other country in the world, although Lithuania might have an argument there. But the fact that they've imposed sanctions or had slowdowns on coal, wheat, barley, wine, rock, lobster, you know, this is affecting not only the politics, uh, but the economics of these two countries. Uh, frankly, I'll say from our time living there, uh, this is not something, you know, foreign policy, yes, is something that kind of we like to talk about, but might not make it into a general election. Uh, China's in the general election, even if it's not front and center. Uh, my neighbors uh, were very much up to speed on what was happening. Even this past week, uh, we saw that uh, Scott Morrison's uh, WeChat account uh, in Australia, right? There are 1.2 million Australians who are of uh, Chinese ethnic background. Uh, Scott Morrison's WeChat uh, was rebranded as a Chinese propaganda outlet, right? Uh, it's a little unclear how this happened. But the interference within Australian domestic politics continues, and I think it's going to exacerbate those lines. Uh, last thing I would say on this is if there's been a clear hardening in the United States on how both, uh, both parties, but also the American public feels about China, uh, the same is true in Australia, right? There was a 20 point swing uh, popularly about how the Australian public uh, viewed Xi Jinping and Xi Jinping's China. And more interestingly, uh, the public, I actually think, is going to help set the pace for the government, whichever government it is. Uh, when the government was asked, uh, when the people were asked, uh, should the government take a harder line, 94% of Australians polled said that they wanted the government to work harder at diversifying their economic trading partners. Quickly. And that that's a trend in polling and politics that is in different ways visible in Japan, Korea, India, and other countries in the region. And nobody in Jung Nang Hai is saying to Xi Jinping, or at least not getting through with the message that, hey, this isn't working, we're pissing everyone off. So probably we can expect that to continue. Uh, we'll wrap up quickly with the last question, if you could put that up. Um, just guessing about the black swans or the external shocks that will rattle leaders in Asia in 2022. Another COVID wave, the Ukraine problem, American political turmoil, it's a witch's brew, increasing climate changes or other. And I'll give you each like 20 seconds if you want to jump in on, 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 the, on the black swan you think we need to watch. And Hannah, go ahead and put those up as fast as you can. Yeah, Ukraine. I mean, it's in the news right now, so maybe that's a bit of a distorted result. 
but uh, but but people uh, people think Ukraine is going to be distracting. We have like a minute and a half, so quick speed round, uh, starting with Victor. Um, what to watch? Well, I, I also picked uh, a Russian attack on Ukraine. Not so much the attack itself, but. Uh, the implications this will have for how allies look at um, the credibility of the U.S. security commitment. Yeah, we don't do anything that looks bad for our allies in Asia. We 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 divert resources that worries our allies in Asia. It's kind of a no-win. Charlie, I would just second that and say that I voted for it as well. Uh, what I hear from all around Asia, not just Australia, is uh, if. Uh, the U.S. responds uh, with all of its attention rallying NATO. Where is your attention on the Indo-Pacific region? If the United States uh, decides that it really does want to stay focused on the Indo-Pacific and won't give too many resources or attention to it, the question is, what has happened to the uh, rules-based order? So it's a very hard knot uh, to uh, untie, and I think that's where the attention is right now. Okay. Well, uh, while those events impact Japan and Prime Minister Takeshida, uh, COVID hits Japan close, closest to home. Uh, you know, uh, the, according to the uh, in, latest NHK poll, 65% uh, support the government's handling of the pandemic so far. And that's good news. But the surge uh, has just begun, and uh, there are some indications that the public opinion may be shifting. So the next few weeks will be crucial for the Kishida government to implement its COVID measures uh, with minimum missteps and maximum uh, mass messaging strategies to show that the pandemic is under control and that he's in charge. Rick? I uh, also echo Russia, Ukraine, India faces environmental crises and and health crises often, but uh, this issue, you know, will, will impact um, the administration's interest and ability on pushing back on uh, CATSA sanctions. And also India's position as one of the few liberal democracies in the world that still has a strong relationship with Russia, that uh, that will become more tenuous. So uh, so I, I throw it in the bucket too, for the reasons others brought, as well as some India specific reasons. All right, so we can wrap up this session by talking about the one leader we didn't talk about. Thanks very much, Vladimir Putin, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, disrupting the system uh, uh, once again. Over next to the panel on security and Jude Blanchett. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Mike. And morning, everybody. That was a very um, apt uh, segue here to our panel, which is going to explore security dynamics. And I think we'll, we'll probably just pick up exactly where uh, Mike and my fellow colleagues left off, which is um, thinking about uh, implications for the region, both of China's rise and behavior, thinking about how events in Ukraine may or may not impact uh, Taiwan, uh, thinking about some of the shifts in security policy and strategy we're seeing across the region, Japan, which we'd like to, to dig into. So this is, a, this is a busy year as ever for the security environment um, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I think this is the 10th year running where China has been the motivating factor for, for many of the shifts uh, that are occurring in the security architecture and strategy. Um, we've got an absolutely fantastic panel to dig into this. Uh, really thrilled to be uh, joined by my colleagues, uh, Bonnie Lin, who is the director of the China Power Project and a senior fellow for Asia Security. Um, at, at here at CSIS, we have Greg Poling, Senior Fellow and Director of the Southeast Asia Program and the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative. Uh, Nick Shikani, who is a Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of the Japan Chair. Uh, and me, Jude Blanchett, the uh, Freeman Chair in China Studies. Uh, but I'm glad to sit more or less on the sidelines here and um, just listen to my colleagues uh, for the next 40 or so minutes. Um, why don't we dive into perhaps one of the most uh, uh, heated discussion points here in Washington, D.C., and I suspect uh, in, in the Indo-Pacific, and that is concerns about growing tensions, uh, escalation in Taiwan. So we'll open up the poll here, and we're going to ask, what is the percent chance that China will use military force against Taiwan in 2022? 80% or over 80%, um, and I guess that takes us from 81 to 100, uh, 60 uh, over 40 or under 20 percent. So we'll give folks a minute here to uh, to put in their answer. Great. Um, okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, uh, obviously, uh, quite a big disconnect from the discussions uh, 
and media discourse that I'm hearing and reading, which, which I would have thought puts this at over uh, 60%. Uh, and what the respondents are saying, which is under 20%. Um, Bonnie, why don't I open up with you on this? First, I'd like to get your reactions um, on the, the, the crowdsource estimate of under 20%. I think one of the questions um, that's top of mind right now is what is feeding into Beijing's uh, possible calculations on Taiwan and timing. Some of the recent discourse has been that Xi Jinping is looking at events in Ukraine very, uh, very closely. And if there's not a robust response by NATO and European allies and partners, that that, that might provoke Xi Jinping to make a, uh, a more near-term rush across the strait. How are you looking at Beijing's calculations right now? Sure. Thank you, Jude. I, I did want to comment very briefly on the poll. So I looked at this question from last year. We had the exact same question. And last year, um, those voting for under 20 percent was 61 percent and this year, 63. So it, there's a surprising continuity. And I it might be the same expected, audience, by the way, as last year. <laughs> it might be. I actually expected there to be, I guess, a little bit more in the 40 percent, given what's been in the news like you. So I was a little bit surprised with this. Um, in terms of uh, sort of how I vote and how I thought about this, uh, I actually interpret the question a little bit more flexibly. So when we think about uh, China's use of military force, I group that into three different categories. The first is um, sort of the day-to-day gray zone operations that China already conducts against Taiwan, which I still view as use of military force. It doesn't involve kinetic strikes or anything, but it still involves PLA assets. The second is a sort of a, a slightly larger operations. Uh, so for example, if China was to seize uh, one of Taiwan's offshore features or islands, but not necessarily an invasion of the main Taiwan island. And the third one, which is I think what most people are actually answering with this survey, is if China will invade Taiwan. That's how I sort of read the response as in most folks are an probably answering the question, will uh, China invade Taiwan? Um, and with that respect, I uh, agree with this analysis in the sense that I don't think there's too much of a chance that um, that Beijing will, will have both the desire, but also the military capabilities to want to engage in that invasion uh, this year. Uh, we have the 20th Party uh, Congress question at the end, so I'll save some of the discussion there. Um, but I think when we're looking at some of the motivations for driving that might be driving Xi with respect to Taiwan, um, I guess a lot of the same factors that we saw late last year, including um, mid to early last year, is still the same factors for this year. There's no major change in Taiwan now until um, until Taiwan's late 2022 midterm elections. Uh, so in that respect, I can understand the continuity in how folks have responded to this. Bonnie, can um, I just from Xi? Can I just sure, quickly ask a, a follow-up question on that? Just uh, sorry to interrupt, but just in the interest of time, M mm -hmm. my sense is I, I I look at the the folks writing about Taiwan policy in China, I get the sense there's a growing consensus that they're looking for a more specific plan coming out of the mm -hmm. Xi administration. You and I have talked about this a lot. I think there is some recognition that the one country two systems framework, especially after the Hong Kong security law, is no longer tenable. The KMT is um, likely to struggle in the 2024 elections. So we might see a, 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 a third consecutive victory, presidential victory for um, DPP. Um, what is your sense on where the discussion is in Beijing and how might um, daylight between Xi Jinping's top line insistence that time and momentum are on our side, how might that uh, intersect or, or react with some of the, the frustration that I think we're seeing of folks saying, hey, we need a new, we need a new plan here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I've seen so far on that is um, that there will be new guidance that Xi Jinping will be uh, sharing uh, or at least being discussed at the 20th Party Congress. We don't have much clarity on, on what those new additions are. But just looking at the language this year, I think there's going to be more specific um, discussion on what will happen after unification with Taiwan. Uh, there will probably be hopefully a little bit more detail in terms of what how China views will be the pathway towards unification. But what I don't know is what that means in terms of how China thinks about use of uh, major military force against Taiwan. Uh, based on what I could see, it is seemed pretty clear that she will be um, she and where China is heading is taking a relatively strong stance against those 
who China views as advocating for uh, independence positions in Taiwan, but also foreign countries or foreign actors supporting such. But it's, I think there's a lot to be seen uh, from what we can, uh, from the 20th Party Congress on where China will be in terms of the specific next steps for Taiwan. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Nick, I wanna, I'll, I wanna come to you in the Taiwan issue, but maybe we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some developments in, uh, in Japan um, in a bit. So I might um, in that ask you to, to address the issue of, of how Japan's thinking on Taiwan has evolved. Um, could I get the next question up, uh, next polling question up, please? Um, so now we're going to shift to the South China Sea. Which development is most likely in 2022? Violence from an unsafe encounter between U.S. and Chinese vessels. Uh, Chinese using military force against a fellow claimant. Rotational deployment of U.S. forces in the Philippines. A turn away from U.S. alliance following uh, Philippine elections. Substantial progress on an ASEAN-China code of conduct. Give it a second here to get some uh, responses. Great, looks like we got the answers coming in. Okay, so uh, uh, more even distribution of, uh, of considerations here. So it looks like our, our in uh, descending order, uh, rotational deployment of U.S. forces to the Philippines, China using military force against a uh, fellow claimant, violence from an unsafe encounter between uh, U.S. and China. Craig, let me turn to you first. Can I? Um, uh, this is a very un-American thing, but can I ask you how you voted, uh, and could I get some res your responses to uh, to to the uh, perspective of the crowd here? Yeah. Um... I voted with the crowd, rotational deployment of U.S. forces, but I don't think any of these things are more than 50-50, right? So it's kind of tough. Um, I, so we saw remarkable progress in the U.S.-Philippine alliance in the first year of the, the Biden administration. They've really turned the ship around. And more accurately, Beijing's bad behavior has kind of forced the Philippines back into the U.S. embrace. Uh, with the announcement during the uh, last BSD, the bilateral strategic dialogue a couple months ago, we know that the U.S. administration, I think, is really trying to race to lock in some of this progress before the Philippine elections in May, including releasing millions of dollars already in construction funds for the EDCA sites, which are the five Philippine bases that the U.S. Uh, has access to. So I wouldn't be shocked if we see some small scale, very quiet rotational deployments to try to lock that progress in so that if the, the election goes badly for the alliance, there's too much uh, inertia to, to reverse. So that seems reasonable. I, on China using military force, I think that that is still unlikely, um, at least intentionally. I think you could certainly have an accidental escalation over an oil and gas standoff or a fishery standoff, or as we saw in November, China trying to block resupply of resupply missions and, and things escalate. But I think overall, Beijing's pretty happy with how the South China Sea is going. Um, why? take the escalation risk of armed conflict when you can just keep choking off Southeast Asian access to their waters uh, and pay no price. The violent encounter between the U.S. and Chinese vessel, I mean, this is just an everyday um, risk, right? We, we could easily see a repeat of the Decatur incident in 2018 where a Chinese Navy ship got a little too aggressive in trying to block a U.S. fawn off and there was a near collision. I think that that's a perennial problem, and it's one that's largely outside the day-to-day -day control, I think, of Zhang Nanhai. I'm, I'm, I think that, that these things have kind of been shopped out to lower levels of the Chinese system, and a whole lot of very nationalistic stakeholders have been encouraged to go forth and defend rights, and every once in a while they screw up and get too aggressive um, and can perhaps escalate before Beijing can step in. The turn away from the U.S.-Philippine alliance, I want to point out, is I think it is much higher than eight percent chance. I mean, look, if the, if the Philippine election were held today, Bong Bong Marcos, son of the former dictator, would be the president. He's made very clear that he would try to repeat the early Duterte policy of rapprochement with with Beijing, and that he doesn't trust the American security commitment. There's a lot of time between now and May, both to I, I guess kind of change his mind, but also for other candidates to to emerge, but I would not discount the idea that in uh, on July 1st, when he takes office in, in the Philippines, the U.S. enters a very rough patch again with the alliance. And, and for the 7% who think there will be substantial progress on a ASEAN-China code of conduct, I would love to try to sell you a bridge or a car. <laughs> um, 
it has now been 24 years and counting since the first draft of the code of conduct was written by Manila in 1998, and there has been zero progress. Uh, Greg, can I pick up on a point you you raised, which is China's relative satisfaction with where we are in the status quo in the South China Sea? Um, there's one argument that if we do see um, uh, some sort of uh, collision uh, a a accidental episode between the U.S. and China, that there may be an incentive for Beijing to tread lightly so it doesn't escalate and invite a shift in the status quo that it's not welcoming. You just made a, a point, though, a structural bureaucratic point about perhaps Beijing may not necessarily be present enough to make a, a quick decision um, to do that. So I, I wanted to ask if you could just unpack that a, a, a little bit more. more. Um, do you see any signs, especially with increasing centralization of military control by Xi Jinping, that attempting to plug that gap between local actors and, and Beijing's ability to steer the ship? Are, are those efforts proving um, any benefit or is this still somewhat of a wild west out there? I don't see any evidence of tighter central control on the water, right? So over the last two years, we've seen a steady escalation of run-ins over oil and gas, over fisheries, over minor resupply missions and law enforcement operations, all of which are almost certainly below the level of attention of Xi Jinping. And, and as you and I have talked about in the past, the, the centralization of power under Xi means that there's less and less deputizing for major decisions. So you need to get something to a pretty significant crisis level, I think, for the boss to pay attention. And the incentives beneath Xi throughout the system are to act tough. I mean, it's, I guess it's the same incentive structure that's been driving all of the bad diplomatic behavior and the self-defeating behavior that we've seen from Beijing throughout certainly the last two years of COVID. And I see it at play in the South China Sea too. China, Chinese diplomats, uh, South Sea fleet commanders, provincial officials in Hainan and Guangdong, they just don't seem to be able to stay out of the way of Beijing's larger strategic goals of being a regional leader. And so every time China makes a little bit of progress, somebody kicks, uh, you know, kicks over, uh, kicks an anthill with the Philippines or Vietnam or Indonesia, and they go back to square one. Um, final question here, um, Black Swan in South China Sea, that we haven't talked about that could really shift or shape the dynamics. Uh, anything, again, problem with back swans is they're hard to predict, but nonetheless, um, uh, what do you see that might uh, throw a monkey monkey wrench uh, in, in how we're looking at 2022? I've got a few in mind. I mean, to, to go back to, to Bonnie's point, I don't think it's inconceivable that China makes a move on Ituaba or Pratas and decides to take it from Taiwan ahead of the party Congress as a low cost, relatively escalation free way to show how tough she is. And I think it probably would be relatively low cost in, in the short term. I don't think anybody's going to do much about it um, beyond the diplomatic and economic cost. I also think it's not impossible that China builds a small facility at Scarborough Shoal at some point, probably something unmanned that could go in in 24 hours and then you get a crisis with the Filipinos. And then the the day to day problem of when you keep playing chicken with foreign oil and gas operators and foreign fishing boats and foreign law enforcement vessels, sooner or later you're going to run into one. We've seen it happen before. And um, as I've said, I think probably each of the last several years at this event, we've been pretty lucky that nobody's died yet. Sooner or later, that luck's going to run out. Um, you know, actually, just while we're on this, and Bonnie, I want to bring you in. Um, looking at uh, um, events that are occurring in Ukraine, some of the more um, to me, unrealistic speculation has been Xi Jinping is is looking at this and will um, will use force if he doesn't feel a forceful response. But one of the things, Bonnie, you and I were talking about is there may be some learning opportunities going on here for Xi Jinping, especially when when President Biden said the quiet part out loud about if there's a minor incursion in Ukraine, um, a, a, a joint response from the EU and NATO will be will be very difficult. Greg, on the scenario you just mentioned about a, a possible uh, a, a possible uh, move against uh, some Taiwanese territory ahead of the 20th Party Congress, do either of you see any connection with response from NATO, EU, US uh, on Ukraine? Does that does the, does a divided response over a, a possible marginal incursion teach anything, Xi Jinping? Teach, teach Xi Jinping anything, or are these just two totally different scenarios? Bonnie, let me let me go to you first. Uh, sure. So, if, for example, the United States does, does not take enough action, it, so sorry. If Russia invades Ukraine and the United States 
uh, has not taken significant action, which I actually don't see happening. Um, it, one lesson learned that could be uh, for Xi Jinping that if it does move on Taiwan, there might be um, less resistance. But I don't think that's necessarily the case because I believe Chinese leaders appreciate the difference in terms of how the United States thinks about uh, Taiwan, the types of uh, the relationship the United States has with Taiwan versus Ukraine. The other thing I would mention is, um, at least for those of us who've done a, quite a bit of war gaming, looking at China's, um, how China thinks about Taiwan's offshore island, exactly like what Greg mentioned, whether that's E2 Aba or any other protest, it's quite, it's not difficult for China to see those islands, but that could rally and cause the international community to take a very hard stance against China, which actually would could make the next steps that China takes against Taiwan to be much more difficult. Greg, any, any thoughts on that? I think that's right. I, mean, I still tend to think that China uh, does not see itself the way Russia does, right? China doesn't see itself as a spoiler. It sees itself as a leader, and it, it recognizes that the benefits of seizing Ituaba are probably far outweighed by the long-term diplomatic costs and driving Taiwanese citizens even farther into kind of antagonism toward Beijing. Yeah. Um, Nick, let me, let me turn to you. Um, and this is a nice segue. The uh, discussion in Tokyo about Japan's, or excuse me, the discussion in Tokyo about China's um, uh, regional behavior and concerns over this are not new, but it does feel like things have really been um, accelerated uh, over the past 12, 24 months. Um, I wonder if we can start out, um, we're going to put the question up here, if we can, the polling question about which security milestone is most likely here. And of course, uh, give folks a chance to vote. And while they do, of course, the theme of China runs throughout um, many of these and has really just been a, a catalyzing uh, feature here. Um, so let me give a second here for folks to vote. Okay, that's, that's probably enough we can get the results. Great. So, Nick, I want to turn to you now. So we've got um, discussion of the new national security strategy, which was what announced last year. I think this came up on the, the virtual meeting between Kashida and Biden uh, last week. Um, improvement in U.S.-Japan ROK trilateral security cooperation, uh, revision of U.S.-Japan defense guidelines are, are, are the top uh, three. And just below that is uh, completion of contingency planning for Taiwan. So let me start with um, you know, the first response, which is national security strategy. Um, how and where does China uh, fit into driving this? And, and what do you know so far about what components would, will be new in the national security strategy? Sure, well, the, the process of developing the national security strategy has, has just begun. Uh, and there'll be a series of, of study group meetings and meetings inside the government. Um, and the schedule looks like it'll be completed at the end of this calendar year, uh, from which will flow a new national defense strategy and also a, a five-year defense procurement strategy. So this is a big year for Japan in terms of um, advancing its, its um, um, strategic thinking um, and its capabilities in response to, to changes in the, in the security environment. Of course, um, uh, the pressure from, from China, as well as increased provocations from North Korea are, are a major um, uh, driver for this process. Um, in that context, the biggest issue in the domestic debate is whether Japan might decide to acquire um, so-called uh, strike capabilities. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida has indicated um, that he's looking at various options to uh, strengthen national defense, including strike. Um, this debate will evolve over the course of the year, and I would suspect pick up in earnest after uh, the upper house election uh, we heard about um, in, in the previous panel. Um, so China's coercion is, is, of course, driving this. The other key factor I would point to, though, um, gets to the, the audience responses about U.S.-Japan South Korea cooperation, and that's networking alliance relationships. Um, I think, of course, Japan is going to strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance, and that process is underway with the Biden administration. Uh, but Japan also wants to coordinate closely with other like-minded countries in the region. Australia, for example. Recently, Australia and Japan 
signed a reciprocal access agreement, which is a significant agreement that um, allows for stationing of forces, more joint exercises and training, um, things that could actually affect trilateral cooperation between the US, Japan and Australia. Uh, you also have the Quad. Prime Minister Kishida is going to host an in-person summit of the Quad, hopefully, uh, sometime this, this spring. Uh, and, and of course, uh, security cooperation is, is uh, one of the key pillars in, in that construct. And then Korea, which is, which is critical um, to show uh, Pyongyang, but also Beijing, um, that the alliance network uh, cannot be divided. And so you have Japan wanting to strengthen its own defense capabilities, coordinate closely with the US to take the US-Japan alliance further ahead, and also network with like-minded countries. And with all of that combined, um, send a very strong signal of, of deterrence uh, to manage this, this era of, of strategic competition with China. Nick, can I, I ask about Taiwan now? It's been obviously striking that we've seen a series of very strong statements coming out of, of Tokyo on linking its own uh, security environment to uh, peace and stability in, in, in the Taiwan Strait. Um, and obviously, a lot of this, again, is, is a deterrent message uh, to Beijing. But I wonder if you can give us a sense of where the discussion and debate is on what exactly Japan would be um, willing to do and when it would be willing to intercede. What is the threshold um, where, where Tokyo might, uh, might sort of take action here? I think that's something that obviously we have a concept of strategic ambiguity here in the United States. Um, uh, wh where is this stand in Tokyo? Sure. Well, former Prime Minister Abe is, is driving the security policy debate with respect to, to Taiwan. Um, last December, he, he made two public remarks that really stimulated the debate on this. Uh, the first was uh, stating that um, a contingency, Taiwan is a contingency for Japan and for the US-Japan alliance. Um, getting to the deterrence signals you just referenced, Jude. But he also, in, in a separate um, um, uh, speech, uh, stated that if the U.S. were to come under attack, um, that would constitute uh, a threat to Japan's uh, security and, and allow Japan to, to exercise so-called collective self-defense. And he was, of course, the architect of a process in 2014 and 2015 uh, to reinterpret Japan's constitution to allow uh, the exercise of collective self-defense in, in circum uh, certain circumstances. Um, wouldn't expect Japan to be on the front lines of a contingency. Uh, um, you, you presume that it would be uh, uh, rear area support and, and logistical uh, support. Um, the US and Japan uh, recently had a, a so-called two plus two meeting. And in the joint statement, there was a reference to planning for contingencies uh, including presumably Taiwan. Um, so I suspect that these issues are, are, are being discussed. Um, but regardless of how uh, Japan might figure, the important thing is, is to signal that, um, again, China cannot drive a wedge uh, between uh, Japan and its, and its closest ally. And, and I think this debate, uh, specifically on security policy with respect to Taiwan, uh, will also pick up in the coming year. Final question, Nick, um, and and um, shifting away slightly from China as to North Korea, we, we've seen obviously a raft of, of missile tests uh, o over the past year. Um, I wanted to ask how considerations of North Korea are shaping both the discussion. You'd mentioned the national security strategy uh, and the role of North Korea in that, but I, I wonder if you could give us a sense of where Tokyo is on interpreting uh, actions on, on North Korea and how, again, these are shaping the, the security discussion there? Yeah, certainly. I mean, being on the front lines of the, of the North Korean threat uh, places a premium on uh, missile defense capabilities. So that's certainly um, at the top of the list in terms of Japan's uh, uh, defense uh, policy and, and defense procurement debate, as well as its uh, discussions uh, with the US. Um, and in this context, again, uh, trilateral coordination with, with South Korea is, is, is critical, um, starting with, with information sharing. Uh, and, and if we want to be more, even more optimistic, uh, maybe uh, joint exercises, things like that, to, to really uh, signal the vitality of the US, Japan, South Korea 
um, network in, in, in Northeast Asia. Um, so, you know, yes, the, 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 the era of strategic competition with China is going to set the long-term trajectory for Japan's uh, defense strategy, but you can't forget uh, the immediate threat posed by North Korea. And so you're gonna see both of these uh, debates evolve in, in tandem over the coming year. Great, thanks, Nick. Uh, I'd like to turn to the next question now. Um, in 2022, security cooperation will deepen the most within AUKUS, the Quad, China-Russia relations, or U.S.-Taiwan relations? Okay, if we could get the results, please. So we've got in first place Quad, then we've got AUKUS, China-Russia relations, U.S.-Taiwan relations. Um, interesting, I actually wanna, this is something I think all of these will touch on everyone here. So let me kind of throw this one um, open and just get a round robin set of responses on whichever slice of the pie you want. Greg, let me start with you. Uh, again, very anti-American, but how did you vote um, and why? So I voted AUKUS um, because I think that there's going to be significant pressure on on Canberra, London, and Washington to all show that there's some short-term progress to be made. Um, I mean, first of all, they've got to complete the review uh, for the subs, which was supposed to be one year, and then, and then they'll presumably give us a, a roadmap for what the sub procurement looks like. But they're also under pressure, I think, to show that this isn't just about subs that will arrive in, in the mid-2030s. They've got to show that this is the start of a more robust military uh, cooperation framework between the three parties. The Quad, I mean, it's it's attractive, and I'd love to say the Quad, and it's what a lot of our partners in Southeast Asia would like to see. I just don't see it. I mean, if you mean Quad as the Quad, I still don't see any evidence that the Indians are willing to make it about security. So if we're talking about trilateral cooperation between Japan, Australia, and the U.S., sure, I'm sure that that will, will deepen. I just doubt that you're going to get the Indians. Uh, Nick, let me shift over to you. How would you vote why? And then also a question, although we'd have to work out what the new... Um, what how, the new way we would say it is there any what's the discussion of a or how receptive would japan be to joining something like AUKUS? i don't know how we would pronounce that with japan joining it but um any sense yeah that, that acronym might be as easy to pronounce as as my last name <laughs> um but uh yeah i actually chose the the quad um you know i i, I take greg's point um, but I think uh, when you're when you're talking about leadership level diplomacy, that's an action enforcing mechanism. So if I had to make a prediction, uh, let me just say that uh, if there's a quad leaders meeting in Japan in the spring, um, there will be some sort of concrete uh, security cooperation framework coming out of that. Uh, I think Japan is very interested in, in AUKUS um, um, for several reasons. Uh, one is uh, the potential to further promote uh, jointness and interoperability uh, among uh, like-minded countries in the region. Uh, more long-term, I think it's the prospect for more defense industrial cooperation. Um, yes, there's the submarine deal, but there's also a, a much broader agenda um, that, that might uh, create potential for, for Japan um, to get involved in the defense industrial front. Um, which is economically more efficient, but also supports um, interoperability in, in the region. Um, so Japan is, is very interested um, and also supports it. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be right on the, right on the, uh, on the inside, but recognizes that all of these arrangements in the region that, that are uh, emerging um, strengthen that network and, and send those deterrent signals uh, that are so important to, to maintain stability in the region. Bonnie, uh, turning to you, and actually, could I could I get your take on the 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 bottom two, maybe in this order? Um, Russia, China. You know, we've been talking a lot about this. That this is obviously very much in the periphery of uh, of concerns and discussions about Ukraine. After 2014, we saw both a, a somewhat muted response from Beijing. But then in the wake of that, a, a deepened relationship between Moscow and, and Beijing. So its immediate response was not indicative of its ultimate response. Um, uh, can you unpack a little bit how you see um, various contingencies in Ukraine uh, possibly affecting the trajectory and depth of, of China-Russia relations? And then, and then quickly, any thoughts after that on uh, 
uh, U.S. Taiwan relations. Sure, thank you, Jude. Uh, let me just start off by saying that in terms of the four options, I chose AUKUS too. So I, I for exactly the same reasons that Greg outlined. Um, in terms of uh, China-Russia relations, the reason I didn't choose that as the uh, the one security relation where I see it has the most potential to develop is um, even though China and Russia have been increasing uh, military exchanges, they recently held an exercise with Iran, military exercise with Iran. Uh, I still think that moving uh, forward, there's uh, it's it's probably going to continue to grow at a reasonable pace, but nowhere close to the clear set of goals and agenda that AUKUS has moving forward, particularly when it comes to not only the nuclear submarine, but also um, uh, advanced technologies like cyber, quantum, um, and others. Uh, in terms of where it will go in 2022, I actually think that China uh, will take a wait and see attitude for what happens after Ukraine. Um, so, for example, if Russia invades Ukraine, I could see um, China needing to support Russia politically, economically, but I could see some question marks on whether China wants to significantly deepen military relations right afterwards. Um, let me also touch briefly on U.S.-Taiwan. Uh, so in terms of prospects for deepening security cooperation, I obviously we see that as um, quite substantial, but it also comes from a already very strong U.S.-Taiwan uh, security relationship. Uh, so the two areas that we've uh, that the NDAA identified for 2022 is to consider inviting Taiwan to RIMPAC uh, 2022, but also uh, explore the feasibility of um, more co enhanced cooperation between National Guard and Taiwan's reserves. That's on top of all the other efforts that we already have underway to strengthen Taiwan's uh, self-defense capability. Great. We've got um, uh, just over three or four minutes left, so uh, I have to make this final one a lightning round. If we can go to the final question here. Um, this fall, October, November sometime, we're going to have the 20th Party Congress, uh, where we'll likely see Xi Jinping uh, take a third term as General Secretary, Chair of the Central Military Commission, and then the following spring, take another term as President of the PRC. Um, by 20th Party Congress, in this question, I, what we mean is the five-year period encompassing the 20th Party Congress, 2022 to 2027. Um, maybe I do a round robin um, if anyone, whoever wants to, to dig in, but I'll start with you, Bonnie. Um, we've got a, a pretty sizable majority here, 56, saying a more belligerent uh, China after the 20th Party Congress and a newly enervated Xi Jinping. How did you vote uh, and, and why? Uh, so I voted that she would be, uh, I guess, more belligerent. Um, partially, it's uh, if you, if you compare she with his uh, predecessors, he's generally more risk taking, and uh, if he has consolidated a third term, I believe he would have a little bit more um, power to think about what he what agenda he wants to advance. And I and uh, just tracing what she has tried to advance, he has quite a bit of a foreign policy agenda. Uh, I would also note that she is only. Uh, Sorry, I should say only. She's turning 69 this year. Um, but comparing that to how long some of his predecessors have stayed in power, whether that's Deng Xiaoping into his 80s and then Jiang Zemin into his 70s, she still has a potential fourth term that he might have in mind. So he might need to think about his third term as making progress for setting up a, a potential fourth term. We've just got a couple of minutes left. I can just get a minute response, uh, you know, minute, minute and a half from either you, Greg, South China Sea, third term Xi Jinping, you've been watching. Uh, you've been watching his playbook evolve over 10 years in, in, in power. What, what do you expect for Xi on his South China Sea agenda of 2022 to 2027? I think we're going to get um, increasing belligerence. And, and so the, if, he, if he feels like the strategy is working, which he does, and the incentive structures are for, you know, if you want promotion, act tough, be nationalistic. Uh, that creates its own, its own momentum um, combined with this kind of neo-Maoist consolidation of power underneath it. She means that by the time any cooler heads can prevail, we're already in uh, a crisis. So I think we are likely to ricochet from crisis to crisis over the next few years, hopefully without you know any of them escalating too much. Uh, Nick, a question of Japan's response here. Uh, any sense on how, what some early thinking is about a, a prolonged Xi Jinping tenure um, and any assessment on, on how their, how Tokyo may be looking at uh, shifts in Chinese foreign policy the longer she stays in power? Yeah, I think increased belligerence is, is a fair bet, and, and that will drive uh, Japan's interest in, in strengthening deterrence. But Japan has a nuanced China strategy. It is also going to look for 
opportunities to interact with Beijing. Uh, and this year is the 50th anniversary of the normalization of diplomatic relations between Japan and China. So Kishida has a, has a delicate balancing act to manage, um, strengthening Japan's defense capabilities, but also uh, exploring opportunities to, to maintain diplomatic ties. And, and that's going to be Japan's uh, uh, MO going forward. Great. Well, I, that, I think that um, we basically are going to wrap up with about 15 seconds to, to spare here. Um, so I want to thank everyone. That, those are some really excellent um, uh, insights um, for what the security environment looks like ahead with uh, a, a, a large number of moving uh, moving parts, uh, plates spinning in the air, pick your analogy. Um, but I think those are great, great assessments. Um, so with that, why don't, we'll, we'll segue over now to my colleague, uh, Matt Goodman, and a discussion on the economic and trade environment uh, in, in, in Asia. So Matt, over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Jude, and um, uh, delighted to be with everybody again. Uh, great conversations in the first two panels. This one, as always, uh, economics is playing cleanup here. Um, I will let you interpret what, uh, what cleanup means. Um, uh, but uh, we've got uh, the gang back together here. Uh, delighted to be um, joined by uh, colleagues. I'll introduce them in one second, but I just want to say, uh, to be clear, we're going to run the same 40 minutes here. So we're going to go to five minutes past 11. So please stick around if you want to hear our final uh, Black Swan uh, wild predictions. Uh, be sure to stick around until five minutes past the hour. Okay, um, with that, I'm going to introduce our, our three terrific uh, panelists. Uh, first, uh, my colleague Stephanie Siegel, who is a senior advisor in the CSIS economics program. Uh, then uh, Scott Kennedy, who is trustee chair, holds the trustee chair in Chinese uh, business and economics. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Bill Reich, who holds the Scholl chair in international business. Um, and um, I think all these folks are familiar to you. We were, uh, we were here last year, and uh, fortunately, I think nobody kept a record of what we uh, predicted then. Um, so, uh, so we're going to just start afresh here, uh, shamelessly uh, moving into our, our predictions for the coming year. So let's, uh, let's get the first question up, please. And we're going to start with macro. Uh, as always, uh, in 2022, economic growth in Asia will outperform or underperform expectations or be in line with forecasts. We'll give uh, give everybody uh, a few a few seconds here. Okay, I think that was a pretty straightforward question. So uh, could we put up the results? Okay, align with forecast. I think next year we're not going to include align with forecast because that's a kind of a cop out. I just uh, rely on the experts. Um, but uh, but that that uh, seems to be what um, what uh, a plurality of people think. Is, is that Stephanie because um, because the forecasts are right or because the forecasts are appropriately high or low um, in your view? Right. Um, well, it's funny because I I think regardless of how we answered the question last year, I imagine we led with well, it's going to have to do with COVID nineteen and the pandemic, um, and I think the answer this year similarly kind of leads with the path of, of COVID-19, but we can add to that kind of the inflation outlook um, and, what, uh, and what that means for the, the policy response. Um, I actually had uh, in my answer, I, I think uh, it will outperform recently downward revisions to the outlook. So our timing for this panel is good. We've had um, well, the Fed meeting concluding yesterday, the news coming out of that, but then also um, revised forecasts for the global economy coming out of the IMF. And the big news was there was a significant downward revision to global growth versus um, where the forecasts were just back in October. So only a few months ago, I think the downward revision was around uh, a half a percentage point for global growth. And that was led by significant downward revisions in the two largest economies in the world. So in the United States, more than a, a one percentage point downward revision to growth for 2022, and China nearly a one percentage point downward revision. So two largest economies, large downward revisions to growth. It had some to do with the pandemic, but it had more to do with what we're seeing on the inflation front and related to that global supply chains. So the, the news here is we're worried about inflation. 
uh, the response to that, at least in the US and in other countries, is to tighten monetary policy and those tighter financial conditions will slow growth. Um, but the other piece to that and where I, I have maybe a, kind of a more optimistic view vis-a-vis -vis these, these downward revisions is on the, the COVID story. So right now where we are in the US and where we are globally um, is in the midst of this Omicron wave. But, and here I'll just kind of defer to, to what I'm reading from those that are expert in this, I think there is hope that with this wave, we actually start to, once it subsides, start to approach something closer to normal. So between vaccines and between immunity conveyed from this latest wave, we may get back globally to something that looks more normal. And that's really the thing that's fundamental to the outlook. So I'm going to be a little more optimistic, I guess, um, but kind of recognizing that we've, we've faced some hurdles here and, and the inflation piece is really going to be key. Okay, can you just, um, and I'm gonna then ask Scott for his view on this as well, but can you just go into a little bit more um, depth on China and, and why the, the, the IMF um, so dramatically, really dramatically, I mean, I think a percentage point's pretty big for them to drop a country's uh, growth. What, what's going on over there? So I'll be interested to hear Scott's answer to this question. So I think it's really two, two things and it actually does lead with COVID. Um, China is one of the few countries that has maintained this zero tolerance policy for COVID. So the minute you have an outbreak, the response is to shut down. So they're still going through these waves of, of um, economic shutdown. Obviously that's got implications for the Chinese economy and for the global economy, given the supply chain issue. So I, I think uh, China's up until now, maintenance of its zero COVID policy is really weighing on growth in light of this Omicron wave and, and its heightened transmissibility. Okay, so Scott, um, your, your views, and can you, can you actually throw in two factors that, that I think are at play in China as well that I'm interested in, whether they directly affect the macro uh, story or not, in your view, uh, which is the Olympics and, uh, and sort of financial risks over there, and whether that's something that could, could affect the outlook, either of those things. Sure, sure. Well, thanks, Matt. It's good to, to get the gang back together again. And um, I'm, uh, I think actually we probably did a pretty good job last year uh, on our, our predictions. Uh, folks can go compare uh, the tapes and, and hopefully this year we'll do as equally, equally well. Um, I, I, I mean, I agree with Stephanie uh, that uh, there's a, 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 an upside uh, that China could uh, enjoy that, that's, that the IMF hasn't uh, calculated in. I think they're risk averse folks uh, down the block from us. Uh, China's got a few, obviously some minuses, uh, significant debt. Uh, they are going over the demographic cliff right now. Um, this is a crackdown on the internet economy, uh, the lockdowns, uh, Omicron's possibility. Uh, the Olympics certainly isn't a boon to their economy. No one's traveling even within China to the Olympics, let alone internationally. Uh, so that's that's uh, and things could go wrong there with protests or whatever that makes things even worse. But they do have plenty of upside. Uh, you've got uh, monetary and fiscal space and they've started to turn the taps on monetary wise. First time lowering interest rates in a while and they could spend more on the fiscal side. Uh, they have about three uh, percent uh, GDP debt problem on, on the fiscal side, but they can go beyond that if they need to. Inflation there is still much lower there than here. Uh, and we saw in 2021, their exports rise a lot. And as our economies continue to grow, China will uh, export more. Uh, the biggest optimists for growth in China are Chinese provincial leaders. Uh, if you go look at the forecasts that they've uh, started to issue in the run up to uh, the early March uh, annual legislative session, uh, they are predicting growth, uh, most of them north of 6%. Uh, which is uh, above the IMF prediction. There's always been that difference between the national leaders and, and the provincial ones, uh, but they've been told they shouldn't do that, but nevertheless, they're doing it. Uh, to me, the big, the big question out there still is Omicron. What happens? Can um, they uh, continue to successfully um, uh, use the lockdown strategy or will it get out of control? Uh, the, I think the IMF's 
expectation is, is that they can. That seems to be what most folks do. And, you know, uh, we tend, this is akin to the conversation we have about debt. How long can China avoid their debt problems? I think it's the same thing here on, on COVID. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and I agree with with everything both of you said, and I'm, I'm sort of on the optimistic end of the spectrum too. Not wildly optimistic, but I think I think things might do a little better than we think with the huge caveat being obviously the virus and, and whether that um, that settles down, which is my hopeful uh, optimism um, about that. Okay, can we put up the second question, please? Which I think uh, gets more into uh, US-China. So which is the following most significant trend in US-China economic relations? Export controls and deco technology decoupling, acceleration of financial decoupling, breakdown of talks, more aggressive trade actions, stabilization, uh, of ties, recoupling, uh, joint action by U.S. and allies on Chinese economic coercion. So let's give it a minute because those are complicated questions. So let's give it another 15 seconds. Um, um, and I know there were sort of multiple choices there that somewhat overlap, but I wanted to sort of explore what people thought were the most interesting and important trends among them. Okay, let's go ahead and put the answers up. Okay, so we've got further export controls and technology decoupling, um, and um, and then some kind of joint action on Chinese economic coercion seem to be the sort of plurality winners, which is which is interesting. The other three kind of coming in uh, behind. Uh, so Scott, let me start with you. But Bill, I know we'll also have views on this, as will Stephanie and I. So go ahead, Scott. Sure, sure. Uh, well, we have a very very smart audience watching today. So I could just stop right there and say it. They're all, all right. That they I mean, you, you voted for that too. Is that it? Yeah. So, but this is this is in some ways a trick question because it's easier to say what's not going to happen. I think D stabilization and recoupling. Uh, despite what uh, USTR Tai said in the speech in October that that Bill hosted, I think the idea that we're going to have a lot of recoupling this year is is very unlikely. I think there's uh, high anxiety and risks are still. Uh, likely. The other things, uh, yes, I think export controls, we're going to see more of those. Uh, we Every few days or so, we see more uh, Chinese companies added. And we know the US is working with Europe uh, and our Asian allies on this. And uh, I should expect some progress. More financial decoupling, no new Chinese IPOs in uh, the US, and some actually pulling off likely and relisting in Hong Kong, Shenzhen, or Shanghai almost no venture capital deals in either direction I expect this year. Uh, there will probably be some kind of joint action on Chinese economic coercion, um, you know, but it's difficult. We saw the EU file a WTO case today uh, about Lithuania, but that's not gonna move the needle. Not, nothing's gonna, no, China's not gonna be scared by that. The challenge is how do you figure out what to do that would move the needle where you can get joint action uh, and really get the Chinese to, to pause. And, and so I think even though 27% were, said we're going to do it, will we do it effectively is, is I, I think the, the big challenge. Broadly speaking, uh, the US and China have a large relationship. Supply chains are sticky. Uh, it's a big market. Companies still want to sell to China and haven't been moving a lot of their investment out. But the broader trend is still significant attenuation of the relationship. You can call it decoupling, don't call it decoupling. We're there's no big forward momentum in the relationship. It's interesting that the Chinese have talked a lot and done a lot more to promote technology self-reliance to deal with challenges of choke point technologies, but they're the one party in this conversation that still talks about the benefits of connectivity for an efficiency, for efficiencies. Within the US government, there's almost no one making a strong argument for having an enduring relationship. The primary focus of the Biden administration isn't on the bilateral ties, it's on allies. Uh, and I've been, what I've noticed the last few months is American industry, even companies that have been very optimistic about the China for market for a long time, seem to be uh, uh, quite dour about long-term prospects and, and, and uh, aren't uh, focused on China as a strategic opportunity down the road. So to me, uh, there most it's negatives, uh, you no, know, Pick your favorite one in terms of which one you think is going to be the most important. 
Okay, thanks. And um, you didn't talk a lot about trade, so let me pull Bill in here. Um, I know you've got views on trade, and you can express those in a second. But um, but let me pull Bill in here. But let me ask it not just kind of what's going to happen with phase. Well, we're beyond phase one now, right? Or at least it's still out there. But uh, um, we've passed the deadline for it. You know, is there going to be a phase two? Is there going to be some kind of negotiated something on trade? Um, and then on the export controls, because you used to do that at um, at uh, at the Commerce Department and are still tracking that. Do you see something different in the Biden administration's approach to export controls with respect to China or more more broadly? Well, I think it's a more uh, carefully developed and, and uh, thought out and internally debated policy than you saw under under Trump, which was Largely, you know, he'd read some, see something on Fox News in the morning and announce a new policy in the afternoon. And then the lawyers would have to spend overnight trying to figure out a legal way to implement what he had said we were already going to do. Uh, you don't see that process in, in Biden, but you also don't see a material change in, in their export control policies. They have kept in place the, uh, the additional extraterritorial uh, rules like the foreign direct product rule that uh, the Trump uh, administration initiated. Uh, I'm not sure they're going to uh, invent more rules, but I think you're going to see uh, aggressive enforcement and uh, of the ones they've got, and which means, you know, more companies on the entities list and more use of the lists that are already there. I mean, the, the reality is that despite what the governments say, uh, both of them are taking actions that are forcing companies to make a choice between them, uh, even though we say we don't want to do that. In fact, our policies are, are forcing companies to do that, and companies are not dummies. Uh, they're going to get the message. Uh, <clears throat> you can see this most obviously um, in, in this, this issue that has come along fairly recently regarding forced labor and, and Xinjiang. Uh, this is a very important issue to the administration. Uh, they've upped their enforcement. Uh, Congress has passed legislation. And what you now see is companies in, in, in the position that no company uh, likes to be in at all, which is, you know, if they do use Xinjiang products, uh, they're criticized in the United States. And if they don't use them, they're criticized in China. So the companies find themselves, you know, no matter what they do, they're in the wrong place. Uh, and that inevitably over time, I think, leads to uh, a risk averse strategy, which is going to mean. Uh, uh, if not decoupling, then, then shrinking their, their footprint in, in China. I mean, a lot of that depends on their business model and the, the kind of investment they've got. But I think the trend is, is fairly clear. Um, I did not vote for the uh, more aggressive trade action because I think that we're in a situation where we're going to buy, unless there's a black swan, which we'll get to later, I think you're going to see um, stasis uh, as far as the negotiations are concerned. Uh, I mean, one of the things that's happened in the United States is that the trade debate has been overtaken by the security debate, and that what is going on with respect to, uh, particularly in the high tech sector, is the linkage of the two, and Chinese imports are regarded as compromising our security, uh, and U.S. exports of high tech products are also regarded as compromising our security, and that makes the debate much more difficult. It's very hard to come in and say, no, they're not when you've got a whole bunch of security experts saying that this is, uh, this is a serious problem. And I think it is a serious problem. Um, what that also means for the president, though, is that he has really no room to maneuver here. He's already got uh, multiple Republican senators running against him for president. Uh, all of them uh, are maintaining that the Democrats in general, and Biden in particular, are soft on China and are undermining our security. They're all competing with each other to see who can be the toughest. Uh, that puts the, the president in an awkward position. If he has a negotiation that leads to making any change, for example, on the tariffs, any lessening of the tariffs, he's going to be accused of, again, of undermining our security. So I think he knows very well if there's a negotiation, no matter what he comes back with, it will be criticized as being ina inadequate. I think the Chinese know that if we were to have a phase two, uh, the Americans are simply going to ask for the same things that Trump asked on subsidies, on uh, forced technology transfer. The, 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 the list of problems has not changed, uh, and the administration's view of those problems has not changed. So the American demands will be the same. The Chinese response will be the same. They're not going to do that. Uh, I don't think they have any enthusiasm for going down that road. 
And I don't think the Biden administration has any enthusiasm for going down that, down that, down that road because there's no political win there for them. So I think you see status quo uh, on that front and continue decoupling on the business front. Okay, um, Stephanie, I knew you wanted to comment on something Bill said, and I'd also like you to ask you to um, to comment on the financial decoupling because you did some work on this last year. And I think in my own view, that's going to be one of the sort of maybe not quite a black swan, but something there's going to be, I think, a little more intensified focus on because there could be in addition to things um, Scott said, you know, some new SEC um, announcements um, on handling of, um, you know, uh, uh, companies listing and in, in, listed in the U.S. and so forth. So I'm interested in your view on that set of issues as well. Yeah, th no, thanks for the question, because that's exactly the, the point I wanted to raise. I, I agree with, with Scott and Bill that there is not forward momentum in the relationship on the government side. Um, but I'm more ambivalent about how the private sector sees this. And in particular, on the financial flows side, you actually see continued portfolio inflows to China. And in fact, while you see outflows from all EMs, the one exception actually is China. So you're having a big draw into China, given the still kind of favorable growth outlook. And so while you can decouple things like exchanges, you can't decouple capital flows. Capital flows are global. And so you actually have ongoing inflows from international investors. You have increasingly a view that Chinese government bonds, I, I actually heard uh, someone recently refer to them as safe haven assets, and the reality that China is increasingly a monetary sovereign. And so I, I think those factors actually kind of weigh against this view of kind of ongoing or, or worsening the coupling. I think it's kind of bifurcated, in particular in the financial sector. I don't see signs of decoupling quite, quite to the contrary. Okay, really interesting. Um, um, I also want to just uh, throw in on economic coercion, the last um, uh, answer, that uh, I agree. I don't think you're going to see a lot of significant um, allied um, action. It's very difficult. You know, there's sort of a collection act, collective action dilemma to use sort of um, some um, game theory um, uh, elements of, of this um, here, I, I think it's going to be very difficult to kind of um, to kind of come up with a collective response, but uh, but it's going to be a continued problem and a lot more discussion. And by the way, shameless advertising department, we're doing a project in the economics program on uh, economic coercion and kind of how to construct a, a, a methodology of, for, for a credible and effective policy response. Bill, you want to say something on that quickly because we want to move yeah, on. I just wanted to pick up on, on Stephanie. I just say one of the things in the wind is this uh, proposal to uh, establish a process for reviewing outbound investments uh, that's been included in the house uh, china bill that was revealed uh, the other day uh, if that passes and i think that's 50 50 but if that passes i think that'll have an impact on financial decoupling in china yeah good point okay let's get the next question up please we're going to do another trade question here um, how will uh, countries in the region respond to the Biden administration's proposed Indo-Pacific economic framework? Welcome it, be cautious, or stay away. Um, so let's give folks a um, let's give folks a second to answer this. Um, and while you're answering, again, shameless advertising, Bill and I um, put out a paper yesterday on the framework. Uh, sort of going through the the topics that have been announced as as part of this thing and um, tried to offer some uh, some constructive ideas about how this might work. Um, and so I commend that to you. It's on the CSAS website. Um, OK, so the answers, uh, the, or the predominant answer seems to be that if response will be cautious. That feels right to me. Um, Bill, you want to start that one? Yeah, I think that's the right answer. I, I, the way this seems to be evolving is um, uh, a bit of a, a gap between what you might call the usual suspects and everybody else. It looks like a lot of the administration's early contact has been with Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Japan, Korea. We're doing a, a, an event this afternoon, more advertising, with the Korean trade minister who's in town and who will be speaking about this. Uh, they all, I think, have approached uh, IPEF with varying degrees of enthusiasm interest in participating in interest in participating but they're the people that you would expect to participate and they're the people whose legal systems and whose rules and regulations are already not that different from what we're talking about 
uh, agreement with them on the kinds of principles the administration has articulated won't be difficult. The real question, which is what uh, the paper that Matt and I produced gets into is, how do we get countries like Vietnam and Indonesia uh, into this? And I think there, these are the countries that are going to be cautious, that are going to take a wait and see approach to see how it evolves. Uh, entering into the kinds of commitments that you know the administration wants um, is a bigger stretch for them than it is for the, for the usual suspects. And they're going to uh, enter into a negotiating process with a good bit of caution, uh, lots of looking at what their neighbors are doing, uh, one eye on what China is doing and what its attitude is doing. Uh, and also uh, with the, the point that Matt and I also made, which is uh, a healthy view of what's in it for me, you know, and so far the administration really has not put a lot of tangible benefits for them on the table. You know, they've said market access really is off the table. Um, and uh, they're by saying that they're not going to take it to Congress uh, for uh, approval. What that really says is, uh, the U.S. isn't intending to make a lot of concessions of its own. So if I were uh, a country in the region, I'd be saying, what do I get out of this? And I think the answer right now is unclear. Okay. Um, Scott or Stephanie, do you have uh, thoughts on sort of how, how you think this is going to play and how credible it's going to be to partners over there? And Scott, if I can throw in, um, you know, the, it's interesting that very few people thought that people will stay away from this, countries in the region uh, will stay away from this because they're afraid of irritating China. Um, do you think that's right? Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything uh, that, uh, that Bill said, and uh, I commend your the, the report that you both wrote. And uh, I think if um, the administration took it, it copy and paste into official policy and ran with it, uh, the United States and the region would be better off, and so I, uh, I hope, I hope that happens. That said, and I think that's you know some. I think the reason countries are engaging and is in part hopeful that uh, the, what will be fleshed out will have some of what you all are are suggesting. But I do think it's important just to remind everybody in my conversations um, with uh, countries in the region and, and Europe and elsewhere, in, included a, a trip in November, uh, every single country that I spoke with would prefer the US to re-enter CPTPP, every single one. And every single one is entirely unsure if US advocacy of an Indo-Pacific economic framework will endure beyond 2024. When we negotiated CPTPP, originally TPP, it took four or five years. I know the administration is saying that they'd like to get something over the line this year. Uh, that would be very, very difficult to do. Uh, but um, and so I think that's the hesitancy is they're worried about what will be in this. Will they get any goodies uh, and what will happen beyond? Because American politics are, are, are so unclear about our long term commitment to economic liberalization and the liberal international order. So I think engagement, they don't think it's gonna tick off China too badly and they don't wanna tick off Washington and, and maybe they'll hope that, that the Biden administration will get more courage than they've demonstrated so far. Yeah, and, and just to say, we do, Bill and I say in our paper that we you know, both have made clear that we agree with you that, that the, you know, the first best approach for the US would be to try to get back um, to something like TPP, meaning a sort of high standard, comprehensive regional trade agreement um, that is negotiated and submitted to legislatures and that has all the high standards that we, we want in there. It may not have to be called TPP or, or, um, or anything else, but, but it, um, it, I think, is still you know, first best, mainly because of the, uh, the, the credibility of it and durability of it in the eyes of our, our um, partners, but also because it's the best shot at really um, in, in, um, ensuring that our preferred rules uh, get advanced on, on things like the digital economy and so forth. Um, and, and so we still think that's first best, but we, we acknowledge and we understand that this is not going to be uh, something the Biden administration is going to take on in the, in the near term. And, and so we, we, we were trying to be constructive and saying, well, if you're going to do this, then, then you need some of those elements of, of tangible benefits and uh, binding and hard rules um, in there. So that, that's really the essence of the paper. Um, uh, 
Also, just one quick thing, uh, one other point that we sort of bolded in the paper is the importance of, of central coordination of this in the US government. Um, uh, this is, I think, the single biggest potential point of failure in this thing, because it's got six or eight strands of work. Um, if you don't have somebody senior in the White House, a single person or a cabinet officer delegated to by the president to run this, I think there's a real risk it's going to fall apart. So um, with that, um, do we want to move on to the next one? Because we don't have a huge amount of time. I think we're going to come back to trade, but let's we're going to do a little bit here on supply chain resilience, which of these strategies is most likely to succeed? And there's a choice there um, that you can make. Um, which of these is sort of most likely to be successful, effective? And I'll give people, because it is again, a complicated question. So um, give you a chance to read through that. Um, Do we get points for the hardest questions, Matt? <laughs> that's right. Um, okay, um, I think let's let's give uh, give folks uh, get folks answers. Okay, interesting. Uh, the, the the almost majority uh, view um, is is that there's going to be more cooperation with allies and partners on protection of critical technologies, and that that's actually the most likely to succeed among these uh, different things. Um, interesting that sort of at the opposite end, cyber attacks, hardening defenses is, comes in last, um, and then the others kind of in the middle. Um, I don't know who would like to take that on. I mean, Bill, you and I and Stephanie actually should get credit for having originally um, conceived of this, but we, um, we've been working with, uh, through a forum um, with, uh, with allied and partner countries um, on some of these technology issues. So do you think that's the right answer, Bill, first? Well, I'm continuing my streak of almost never voting for the winning answer. Uh, so uh, I don't, but I don't think it's the right answer. Uh, I think, you know, the, 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 the difficulty here is that cooperating is a really broad term that encompasses a lot of things. Uh, I noticed, for example, with Europe and the Trade and Technology Council, they agreed to cooperate on export controls. And Matt and I uh, met with, with some of uh, their people on, on Monday. And one of the questions was, well, what does that mean? You know, and cooperation could mean every three or four months we get together and talk about, you know, the geopolitical landscape, but it could also mean that we agree to share information with each other about export license applications, and we agree to coordinate our answers so that we are all, you know, marching to the same tune and, and giving the same decision for the export of similar stuff. There's a big difference uh, in, in the spectrum of cooperation. I think, you know, if you conceive of cooperation of, of as meaning let's get together and talk about it. Sure, you know, that's gonna happen. There's gonna be a lot of that. Uh, I don't see, uh, including in Europe, a lot of enthusiasm for a lot of activity at the other end of the spectrum, which is let's really sit down and share information on specific decisions and let's coordinate our decision-making process. And let's make sure that we all come out in the same place in making decisions. Uh, that we may end up there and I don't, and we were there in the Cold War. This would be going backwards in a way, uh, but right now I don't see it. Uh, I don't. I don't see it happening. So, okay. Um, does um, Scott or Stephanie have thoughts on this, including like on the semiconductor issue, Scott, and whether there's you know there's there is now this um, new bill in the House um, uh, to invest more um, in that and other things here to strengthen our competitiveness? Or is that likely to be? Uh, successful um, or other dimensions of this? Sure, sure. Uh, briefly, I want to hear what uh, Stephanie has to say about this as well. So on on, on semiconductors and stuff, the uh, uh, U.S. Congress is, um, uh, the, its two houses are competing with each other for what the, what a perfect bill would look like. Uh, and they may uh, play this game for a few more months. Uh, I hope uh, that they will eventually uh, do what uh, professors who encourage their PhD students to do with their dissertations. That is a done dissertation is more important than a perfect dissertation. And the same for, for this, um, there's a consensus that we need to invest more in semiconductors. So let's get it over the line. I, I hope that's where we eventually end up uh, and that partisanship doesn't uh, get in the way. I would just say though, that it's important to, with the, with the wording of this, that, uh, that people understand, 
uh, we the question says reestablishing U.S. semiconductor leadership. I think it's still it's it where we stand vis-a-vis -vis China is important. That that empirically and the U.S. or West broadly still has overwhelming dominant leadership in the semiconductor industry. It's not even remotely close. We face three challenges. China is trying by hook or crook to obtain advanced technology for chips and chip manufacturing equipment and design tools. Uh, there are potential supply chain disruptions because of globalized production, not just what runs through China, but what runs through everywhere. Uh, and there is a need to continue to innovate on chips, uh, more advanced chips. Uh, but we are trying to protect our huge lead, not reestablish it. And so that's that's the challenge. And I think it's important that we understand that we're trying to protect this lead as opposed to catch up uh, in this area, because I think that's that level setting uh, will, will help us figure out what are the smart policies uh, and, and what are wrong policies. Uh, so okay. anyway, sorry to no, uh, focus helpful, on that. Helpful clarification, of it, good point. Uh, Stephanie? Well, and just quickly, I'll, I'll join Bill in kind of picking the wrong answer here. I was surprised at how low cyber attacks are, um, in particular, because I think that's actually the most critical item on that list. And so my maybe it's more of a hope than an expectation, but that cyber attack uh, and protection would actually be um, prioritized. But um, I've actually voted for, um, I think the question was, what has the greatest chance of success on the reshoring is what I chose because um, those tricky issues of coordination that Bill was getting at and kind of tangibly what can you deliver, the, the benefit that the reshoring piece has is that the U.S. can unilaterally decide that it will dedicate resources in a particular area. And so I, I don't know that kind of economically that's the best answer, but I, I do think that the ability of the U.S. to kind of act without uh, necessarily coordinating um, is kind of an advantage for that approach. And it also aligns with some other um, priorities that have to do with job creation, that have to do with kind of limiting our vulnerabilities in the light of, you know, the supply chain problems that we've seen. And there are also environmental considerations here and just kind of the, the transport piece and how that plays into environmental priorities. So I I, I voted for that one. I, I think that that that's all very sensible. And, and you were um, uh, uh, charitable as an economist and saying, you know, whether this is all the best thing from an economic point of view, because there's going to be a cost if we're going to if we're going to sort of forcibly <laughs> try and re uh, reposition um, production in, in different parts of the world, um, whether in the U.S. or, or near shoring or friend shoring or whatever. Um, and, and that has to be taken in consideration. And it really, there's a risk of protectionism and, you know, uh, problems with, you know, the, the undermining further the, the, the rules-based order. Okay, so let's, um, let's do the last one, which will uh, be a fairly quick uh, answer, which is uh, in 2022, will China's bid to join CPTPP, the successor to TPP, go nowhere, gain momentum, rapid momentum, be rejected, be approved. Um, and um, I know the right answer to that one. But I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, give uh, the audience one more second, and then we're going to uh, put up the answers. And then, by the way, after this, we're gonna do our own personal black uh, swan guesses. Uh, so, uh, uh, Bill, you want to do this, and and the other two happy to no. jump in. Yeah, I'm I'm a, kind of a black swan on this. If if the question were not limited to 2022. I would have said it's going to be approved, uh, I, and I think that people who think that there's no chance of that are missing the boat. Uh, I think what you will see is gain slow momentum over the years, or over the year. It's going to take a long time to get there, but basically the Chinese have several tactics. Uh, I mean, one they could actually uh, reform to meet the standards, but putting that aside, uh, the most likely thing they'll do is you know promise to meet the conditions and then not do that. Uh, and bully the existing members into lowering their standards. Uh, and I think they've got a good shot at it. You've already had and, several countries come out in support and, of their membership. And even more charitably, um, you know, China is going to probably at some point, and I do think this will probably happen this year, is going to be invited to be an observer in TPP, CPTPP meetings. And um, that's a pretty powerful position to be in because it's, you know, you're, you're in the room listening to the discussions and getting a little bit of an edge. So I think I think this is a serious thing. I would say, you know, gain slow momentum is what I picked because I think this is something that's a real, um, a real um, a meaning. But I mean, with a sort of positive, a, a spin somewhere between gaining 
slow and, and fast momentum, it's going to be a bigger risk to us than I think we are acknowledging here or that the audience, frankly, um, seems to think. Scott, you want to add something? And then we're going to just do a quick lightning round of our... I think those who say it's going to go nowhere uh, depend on uh, a, a few members who are close American allies who have uh, who are worried about China or suffering from Chinese coercion, who will just tell the Chinese niet. Uh, in the short term, I think that is true. But if uh, IPEF doesn't work out and the U.S. has no strategy of its own, uh, then uh, the, the the table turns in the direction you and Bill said it would. Right. I agree. OK, um, let's go around. Stephanie, I'm going to call on you first. W what sort of thing did we not talk about that you think might happen this year? Um, well, I'm going to go a little bit more kind of in the block swan direction, maybe. I, I We didn't talk at all about kind of... Um, uh, digital assets, cryptocurrency. I, I think um, there's, you know, we can do hours long discussion on that topic, but I, I think there's the potential that we actually have some regulation in that space and that regulation, I mean, that bubble has been pricked. I think it could actually fully deflate and that that could have some real implications, um, downward implications for the economic outlook. Good, I'm glad you raised that because I was gonna say something about digital currencies, but let's, uh, we're out of time. Uh, Bill, why don't we go with you and we'll let Scott wrap it up. Mine's high risk is a short term. COVID ruins the Olympics. The Chinese don't cope with it well, look bad. Okay. All right. Interesting. Scott? Um, not starting in Asia, but bouncing back to Asia. If uh, the US decide, if, if Russia goes ahead and there's a war over Ukraine and the US pulls out sanctions on uh, finance and, and tries to kick the Russians out of SWIFT, I think that accelerates. Uh, moves by Russia and China to create alternatives to SWIFT uh, and other financial changes, which will which would throw markets uh, into a, a tizzy. Uh, and so that's something uh, those second or third order consequences of sanctions uh, could come back to bite us. OK, good one. And uh, mine is that um, and I'm going to slightly use a weasel out of this. I think when we do this next year, I think we're going to be talking about the U.S., um, taking the U.S., Mexico, Canada uh, free trade agreement and building on that as a new um, platform for um, for trade negotiations. And the reason I'm I'm sticking my neck out in an optimistic way because of my view that that is part of the uh, ultimate uh, U.S. interest to be engaged in an activity like that. And that seems like the line of least resistance if you're going to go down that road. Okay. Uh, we're out of time. We're over time a minute. Uh, thank you all for sticking around. We still got almost 300 people on here. Just this has been a terrifically rich um, conversation for me. And I hope for all of you, uh, we've heard about uh, some a lot of uh, political developments over the year with elections and di diplomacy. We've heard about some security risks, uh, traditional and new. Um, and uh, and I, I think the economic uh, discussion could have gone a lot longer. There's a lot more to talk about. But this has been really um, a terrific uh, um, event, and we hope it's been good to you. And uh, you can check our results next year and see how well we did. But for now, let me say on behalf of Mike Green, on the behalf of the entire Asia team, um, thank you for joining us, and we'll, uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.